We are live. Hello, everybody. Can you hear us okay? Give us a thumbs up somewhere if uh, you can hear us. Okay. We are we are live. Hello, everybody. Welcome to our first Facebook Live event. Um, we are. Oops, I'm getting a standby. Nope. You're live. Yay. Hi, everybody. Welcome, welcome. It's fun to see some names pop up here. Hello, hello. Oh, there's no audio? Can anybody hear us? Can we confirm? we are good. I think we are good. Hi, everybody. Hello, Facebook world. Welcome to our very first Facebook Live. Um, this is our native plant and organic veggie gardening, Ask Me Anything. Um, and we're really glad that you're here. Um, if you're new to our page, we are the Conservation Foundation. We are one of the area's oldest and largest land and water conservation organizations in the area. Um, our mission here is to improve the health of our communities by preserving and restoring open space and natural lands, protecting rivers and watersheds, and promoting stewardship of our environment here in Northeast Illinois. And one of the ways that we do this is by working with folks to bring nature right into their own backyards. Uh, my name is Abby Beck. I am the Vice President of Advancement for the Conservation Foundation, and I've asked some of my colleagues and resident plant experts to come answer some of the common questions that we receive about incorporating native plants into your home landscaping or growing your own food right in your own yard. Um, and so this is also a shameless plug for our upcoming plant sale. We have a native plant uh, kit and organic veggie starter kits going on sale later this week. Um, and we also have our in-person plant and uh, native plant and organic veggie plugs uh, going on sale uh, Mother's Day weekend, that Friday and Saturday. I'll put all of the details in the chat to our website where you can get dates and times and location details. Um, and then speaking of the chat as well and to this discussion here, we'll be taking your questions live. So um, if you, whether you're new to gardening or you've been doing this for a long time, Please feel free to join the conversation when you stumble upon this, uh, this little Facebook Live. Uh, we've been collecting comments and questions here for the past couple weeks, and so I will be uh, reading that then to our panel of experts for them to answer. But at any point, join us and uh, let us know what's on your mind as we're thinking spring and all getting excited to finally get outside and get our, get our nails dirty. Um, so without further ado, I want to introduce the team I have here with me. I have Kyla, Jim, Connie, and Nancy. Um, why don't each of you introduce yourselves? Um, tell us your name, your title, and a little little glimpse into your expertise. Um, I will start with Kyla. Hi, everybody. I am Kyla Muhammad. I'm the Community Engagement Coordinator at the Conservation Foundation. I am also a Master Naturalist, and I've been... Um, an organic gardener for over 10 years. I've studied things like um, wild edible plants as well as sustainable and regenerative um, agriculture. And so I'm very passionate about merging, um, you know, food for people with wildlife and supporting the ecosystem. Awesome. And how about you, Nancy? Nancy Sonato, and I got to the Conservation Foundation by way of College of DuPage, actually. One of the classes I took there was a uh, landscaping design class, which I thought that was the direction I was headed in. Um, I enjoy design a lot, have an eye for it, I think. And then I took Jim's uh, landscaping for wildlife class and said, oh, that's really what I want to do. So um, here is a program administrative assistant and get to do all sorts of fun things and sometimes get to uh, help design gardens. 
nothing official, but I get to put my two cents in. Uh, Nancy did some lovely design uh, garden designs for our plant kits, and I will put that uh, link in the chat as well, and it'll come up when I ask one of my questions here in a little bit. But uh, speaking of Jim, go ahead, Jim. Uh, I'm Jim Kleinwalker. I work as uh, the Conservation and Home Program Director. Um, I started almost 20 years ago and realized that people want a little help. So that you can read online that doing sustainable things is good and that Chemlon is not good, but there's a huge gap between a little bit of knowledge and boy, how would I ever do that? So with the Conservation at Home program, we bring that connection. I go to people's yards. I get the best job ever to walk around these properties and see them help people and bring the joy of native plants to them. Last but not least, Connie. Hi, everyone. I'm Connie Kohlmeyer. I am an environmental educator with the Conservation Foundation, so that means I get to work with kids mostly, but families and adults as well. And uh, I get to spend time both in the natural areas, also out in schools. We go out and visit schools with the kids and at the farm in South Naperville. We've got a garden and we do nature on the farm camps and all kinds of programs there. So I get to do nature education and gardening education with kids. And then um, speaking of COD and classes over there, I also teach in the sustainable urban agriculture program at College of DuPage. So I teach vegetable and herb production, composting and all kinds of things that help to grow vegetables and herbs. So I can answer some of those questions as well. Awesome. awesome. Well, thank you so much for, for joining me, team, <laughs> for, for doing this little experimental Facebook Live. Um, really excited to answer some of your questions. If you have them, again, add them to the chat. Um, I see one question here, um, and it says, what is your favorite cheese? That's just my husband trying to help me test the audio. So thank you for submitting your question and showing that the chat works. Jeff, appreciate that, but we'll skip hey, over that one for now. One and uh, dive into some actual gardening questions. Um, I think the best one to start with, and so like I said, we gathered some uh, via email from our members uh, over the past couple weeks. Um, and I think one of the great like beginner questions and one that I had myself was, if you want to put in a pollinator or a rain garden and you're just starting out, how much space do you need to get started? Is there an ideal space? Is there a minimum space? Um, uh, and Nancy, maybe that would be a good design question for you. you know, I think a mistake that a lot of people make is uh, trying to plant in too small a space. And it's uh, for best impact, you want to have, um, if it's up against the house or up against a fence, I would say, you know, at least four feet out from the fence and maybe eight feet wide. Uh, that would be sort of the minimum because you want to be able to put in groups of plants. Um, you only put in one if it's sort of a featured plant like the Baptisia. Or it's big, it could be in the center. Um, but other plants you want to try to do in threes or fives or sevens, you'll get the impact of the color and uh, can scatter them around in groups. So that works best if you actually do a slightly larger size bed sure and Jim I know you get this one a lot you know when it comes to these native plants and if somebody's trying to do a smaller space in their yard um, native plants have that perception of kind of being wild looking and, ha and spreading really easily um, what's been kind of your experience with um, folks that don't necessarily want a wild native look or don't want something that's just going to take over the whole garden that's the thing. Um, it's right plant for the right space. So we talked to them about some plants are very well behaved and some are spreading. And some people want it to spread. They've got a big area in the back and they want it to, you know, something that they can have go over there. So it's just a matter of finding the right mix of sun and shade, wet or dry, and uh, the habit. Sure. Well, speaking of that, because of the habitat that they want, we have a question here on Facebook that says, easiest plants for landscaping that can be near shade all day. Um, and 
Tara that answered asked this question said I'm in Central Florida um, unfortunately we are in northeastern Illinois so we're going to be speaking to what works best in our Midwestern uh, native climate but for those also in Illinois um, Jim what what's the best what's the best uh, easiest plants for landscaping in the shade right now I've got woodland phlox Virginia bluebells all blooming and looking wonderful and uh, the bluebells will fall and the ferns pop up after that and wild ginger so there's beautiful things uh, wild geranium is really nice so those are some of my favorites uh, Jacob's ladder is just stunning too I've got celandine poppy uh, wood poppy it's a yellow flower that's blooming right now the most of the flowering or shade is going to be in the spring and then it comes it just goes back to a nice textural thing in the summer green that's my backyard it's all shade so it's okay. beautiful right now and then it gets uh it's it's just very green over the summertime <laughs> can i add to that yeah for anybody who's in florida or somewhere else um the spring flowers are basically the woodland flowers so if you're a different area try to learn what what naturally grows in the woods shaded areas in your state um, and those would be the plants that you would want to plant in the shade in your garden yeah well switching over to some veggie questions um for you Kyla and Connie as kind of veggie experts here on the panel um for people that are trying to grow, you know, tomatoes and peppers and stuff in their backyard, I know a common complaint is um, getting them pest resistant um, or resilient in an organic and chemical free sense. Do you have any recommendations for folks that are looking to combat those pests? Oh, I'll jump in first and I'm sure Connie can, can add on to it. Um, so, you know, one, one technique is really companion planting that's essentially where you're planting two different plants together um, that, that provides some sort of mutual benefit and so um, with companion planting there's all sorts of different um, approaches one of which is to try to um, attract beneficial insects into your garden space that are going to essentially kill and eat those garden pests and so um, even pulling this back to native plants, a lot of our native plants are really great for attracting those um, different beneficial insects um, into the garden space. And so having those nearby um, your veggie plants can definitely help. Another um, strategy too with the companion planting are there are certain um, plants that you can call trap plants and those trap plants are basically you're you're sacrificing those um, because they're going to lure in those things like those aphids and some of those other um, you know beetles that might eat your crops and things like that um, or the or the um, the flea beetles and, and things like that and they will be more attracted to your trap plant than the crop you're trying to grow so there's certain ones like I know blue hubbard squash is a very popular one or um, the squash family, anything in that uh, cucurbit family. Um, so like squash, melons, cucumbers, the um, blue hubbard squash is one that will lure them away um, and in, from, from some of those other ones because it's more attractive. I'll let Connie add in a couple other strategies. I love the sacrificial plant. <laughs> Go ahead, Connie. Yeah, the sacrificial plants is actually, it's a really good method. Um, and there are all kinds of plants that, that do that, that a lot of times we don't even expect. So um, smartweed is a really good trap plant for Japanese beetles. So if you have smartweed popping up, instead of, you know, we have, you know, we have, tend to have this thought that we have to pull every weed as soon as we see it. But sometimes what a weed is, is even subjective. So, um, Sometimes it's better to leave them. Like I said, they can attract in some beneficial insects that will help. You're really trying to create that ecosystem. So if you have, um, you know, like the conservation at home that Jim can speak more about and Nancy can speak more about, when we're trying to create a nice balanced ecosystem, <clears throat> excuse me, we're 
putting things in place that allow the other elements of that environment to do some of that work for us. So we don't need to worry about pest control because maybe we have ladybugs eating those aphids or we've got lacewings coming in. So we're supporting that environment that takes some of the pressure and work off of ourselves. Then in the meantime, though, while we're working on creating that balanced system, we still sometimes look for some support and there are organic methods of treating certain things, but we have to keep in mind that just because just because a product is organic doesn't necessarily mean that it's just safe across the board. So if you were to use something like um, BT is a bacteria that we can use, people often spray that on their things in the cabbage family, broccoli, things like that, to help with the little cabbage worms. But it harms any soft-bodied insect, so that can also include some of our caterpillars and things that we want. Um, so the, these things are not selective, and we need to be very careful in our application. Um, also things like diatomaceous earth, it's an organic product, it's made from fossilized little um, diatoms, little sea creatures. That technically is not toxic, and it's an organic product, but we don't want to breathe that in. It's not good for our mucous membranes, and it's also not going to be good if you have bees visiting flowers or, you know, so we need to be very careful even if something is organic. We still only use it as a last resort, and we just have to be very careful in the application. But, um, you know, sticky traps and things can give a little bit of support in the meantime while you're working on creating that environment that, you know, working toward that balance that is the goal. From a native plant side, Jim and Nancy, are there common pests that you see, insect pests, and any best practices for keeping them out of your flower bed? The insects aren't such an issue, um, but a lot of people talk to me about rabbits or deer, <laughs> those types of things. <laughs> the pests are a little different, and there are some plants, uh, most of the insects and other creatures uh, don't like smelly things. So anything in the onion family, like nodding wild onion, uh, anything in the mint family, like bee balm, monarda, they're odiferous. And they are pretty much, not only will they not eat them, but they stay away from them. So if you grow um, onions on the outside of your flower beds, a lot of times that can discourage some of these uh, pests from coming in there and then we tell people too that you know instead of planting one cone flower that might be a favorite of rabbits but if you got a, a group of them going a little nibble here and there it doesn't hurt them so um, the plants typically like the native stuff has lived with these insects and, and other predators around them for quite a long long time and um, we try to tell people it's sustainable and long-lived so that you know there were buffalo trampling the prairie and fires would burn the prairie down and the plants still come back. Any any veggie veggie comments for rabbits or deer or anything like that as well? I'll I'll start with this one and then Kyla, if you want to add, we'll yeah we'll just keep jumping back and forth between us here because I'm sure we both have similar answers and maybe but maybe you'll think of something that I don't. Um, but I love what Jim said about the using plants as deterrents. So it's the same in the vegetable garden. Your onions and garlic and things like that are really good to plant um, around the edges of your garden, but also to intermix your plantings. Um, the other thing is if there are other things for the animals to eat, then that takes some of the pressure off of your garden. So when we work really hard to have that pristine lawn that's nothing but grass, those rabbits don't really have a whole lot of choices of what to eat in your lawn. But if you have a little bit of a mix, if there's clover, if there are other plants and other options, then that takes a little bit of the pressure off of your vegetable and herb garden. And typically the herbs don't get bothered too much, but if, if they're hungry enough, you know, they'll, they'll eat quite a bit of that. You can always use physical barriers like fencing and covers and things, but sometimes that will work for some critters, but not others. You know, chipmunks will just climb right over that. So it depends on what we're dealing with. But in terms of the onions and garlic, another thing you can do is actually mix up your own, um, like you can take garlic cloves and crush them, 
fill a bottle with water and basically let it sit out for a good 24 hours and make like a strong garlic tea and then spray that on some of your plants that are a little more susceptible, like your lettuces. It's not going to harm the lettuce at all, and you wash it before you eat it. I mean, unless you want garlic-flavored lettuce, then that's fine too, but that helps to try to keep some of those animals from nibbling on some of your veggies as well, and it can even repel some of those pesky insects also. Interesting. Yeah, just to, to add a little bit on to that, um, biodiversity can really go a long way um, in terms of just some of those other uh, garden pests, like Connie was saying, if you have a, a lot of different um, plants and biodiversity in your yard, then they have more choice, <laughs> and, 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 and your um, vegetables and things aren't necessarily as much of a, of a target when there's a number of other things for them to get into and eat. Um, I was also going to kind of pull in even talking a little bit about the, the fencing and things like that, you know, we, we don't, also don't want to forget about adding in some of those, um, like those edible shrubs and things like that, that are, that are native, you know, you've got um, currants and gooseberries and, um, and things like that, um, that you can, that you can also incorporate that are edible into your garden. And, you know, in those earlier years, when you're young, you might want to put a little bit of fencing um, around them because the, um, the, the deer, rabbits, things like that, like shrubs when they're young and tender. Um, but as they start to mature over, over time, then they become also less appealing. So, um, as those, as those shrubs mature, you can then take the, the fencing down, but you might need temporary pr uh, protection for some of these things while they are, um, kind of establishing. Okay, well, uh, going through a list of questions here, um, here's a very good specific one that anyone can answer that has a good idea. Uh, I want to, is there a good resource to find plants that fit a certain space? So that's just an interesting first question. And then Kelly is specifically looking for a perennial that has red flowers and grows about three feet tall. So is there some, is there a, is there a resource out there that you could plug in your own kind of like parameters and specifications to pull up a list of plants that might fit that? And then specifically any um, red flower, three feet tall red flower perennials. Well, for me, um, when people tell me about those specifics, um, my daughter-in-law wants some white things to grow under her oak trees and so she bought a bunch of white roses yesterday and uh, that's not the natural way and in many cases it's not going to work so i tell people like you know having some beautiful flowers that are going to be connected to the environment um, when we start getting too specific i want this to be this way um, it's more about us than it is about the ecosystem approach and so um, I try to discourage that a little bit and then give them some guidelines to say, well, I may not have a red, I mean, cardinal flower might fit that, but it's very specific in where it grows. And um, it may or may not want to be in that site. But um, there are always some things to choose from. They just may not be that color, exactly that height. So um, I guess thinking about the ecosystem approach helps. I was just going to add to um, a resource that I found helpful. Um, there is a native plant nursery out in Moni, Illinois, the Possibility Place, and they have a very helpful plant finder feature that you can um, you can filter for you know um, the soil conditions, the sunlight. Um, I think if it's edible, I think max height, and you, you can filter all these different factors into it. I'm not sure specifically if, um, if color is one, but if, once you put in all those other growing conditions that you're looking for for that space, it comes up with a list with pictures. So you can actually see what the different plants look like and then drill into it and then, um, you know, kind of go from there. So that's a way that you can both match that right plant to the right place, 
while also taking a look at what it visually looks like um, in your landscape planning. So I find that is a very helpful um, plant finder too, so you can kind of back into something that would work for that space. Yeah, that's a good one. I just put the link to the plant finder in the chat for folks. And, and Kelly was also asking specifically because she wants red for hummingbirds. Anyone have a hummingbird, um, any other hummingbird recommendations? Well, the cardinal flower that Jim mentioned is definitely a, attractive to hummingbirds. Um, the other one that I that came to my mind, if you're talking about red and three feet tall, is a monarda that's um, actually native more in the northeast that grows around here. It's called Jacob Klein. It is a cultivar, uh, but it's still very attractive to pollinators. And I'm pretty sure it would attract the uh, butterflies too. And then uh, the, uh, what is it, Celine? What's its yeah. common name? Um, royal catchfly. Yes, royal catchfly. The hummingbirds really love. That's okay. full sun. Mm -hmm. um, the penstemon is another one. There's the bell shaped flowers that the hummingbirds like. It's typically white, but there are some um, cultivars that are red. And um, again, the, the native one is white but it's still a very attractive hummingbirds. That's exactly what I was going to say is that if you're looking for red specifically, then you know we've got some good options there. But then if you're looking at red because you want to attract hummingbirds, there are other flowers that will attract hummingbirds even though they're not red. So if you're flexible on the color, I would look more for the shape of the flower. Like um, Jim just mentioned, a bell-shaped flower. We have, um, even at the farm, there's a big patch of a flower called mallow. It's like a marshmallow, I <laughs> think marshmallows, and it grows uh, where it's more damp. And so that might not be appropriate for your space. But just as an example, they're a very, very pale white with a little bit of like pinkish purple in them and the hummingbirds love them. So sometimes the shape of the flower makes a big difference too, even if it's not that bright red color. And the other thing to think about is the season. So the penstemon um, talks about beard's tongue is, you know, late May, blooming late May. Other things we mentioned are more in July. So it's good to think about providing these uh, for, the, for the pollinators throughout the season. Yeah. Okay, Connie, you mentioned kind of wetter areas. And that was a question we had received. And maybe, Nancy, this would be a good one for you. Any suggestions for dealing with water pooling at one corner of your house or one corner of your yard? You want me to start on that? So we, um, in addition to um, promoting native plants, we also sell rain barrels. And that can be very helpful to um, put in a rain barrel or two. You can. The rain barrels we sell, you can connect more than one together using one downspout. So that can um, you get a lot of water, um, you know, collect the water, which you can use for your flower beds and your pots and such, but then you can also, there's an outlet so you can divert it away from your foundation. And then also putting some of the deep-rooted berry plants um, around the foundation or shrubs that have a more extensive root system than turf grass does, which are very short um, it can really help in so soaking up the water and keeping it out of your basement yes and I am going to put in the chat right now our plant kits so we have plant kits going on sale this week and Nancy put together some plant kit designs to accompany these plant kits and one of them is a rain garden kit um, I am going to be planting, purchasing and planting that rain garden kit. I've diverted some of my downspouts into a wet area. I've kind of dug it out a little bit so that it creates a little reservoir for the, for the water. Um, and I'm so excited to get these plants in the ground. And I know they'll be kind of spread out at first. Do you recommend doing any mulching in a rain garden situation in between plants to start, Nancy? Are you going to say something, Jim? You go ahead if you want. Yeah, I can reach that. Um, you said you had all the leaves earlier. You talked about leaves. 
they're a good thing. I mean, you don't need a bunch of wood chips necessarily. A lot of the prairie plants are not used to wood decomposing, where woodland plants love that wood, but uh, the prairie stuff likes leaves. So um, shredded leaves are a wonderful thing to put down and cover the soil. And then if you plant your plants in clusters of, the, of two or three, then you can really get a nice effect and um, you can kind of learn as people are understanding their native plants, they don't know a lot about them. So if there's three of them in a triangle, then you kind of say, well, there's this one and there's that one. And you can triangulate the other one. And so you can find out the difference between your natives and the weeds. Can I also just add to um, going back to the person's question about, you know, water pooling in their yard. Um, I had the same issue in my, my own backyard in particular, where there was large amounts of water pooling um, and putting in uh, a couple of strategically placed rain gardens um, filled with, with native plants definitely has helped um, fix that, that issue. And I did that about three years ago. And every, every year, as those root systems are continuing to, to um, build out, it seems like it's it's capturing even more water and kind of holding it um, in place a bit better so it can s slowly filter out. So um, I just wanted to say personally that the rain gardens, they, they definitely do um, help with some of that, that standing and pooling water. Yeah, I first-hand knowledge of how awesome Kyla's backyard water <laughs> retention and stormwater management is. And there's a video, if I'm quick enough, I'll try and find the video and put it in the chat too. If you have water problems and want to see a really good example of how to manage them in your yard, um, Kyla's backyard is um, just a, a great demonstration of all of that. Uh, another question for you, Kyla. Um, that I think the answer is native plants in containers. Um, do, can you grow native plants if you don't have a big yard, if you don't own a yard, um, if you're working with um, a small patio or a balcony or something like that, you know, what are the best options if you're trying to still get some native plants into your life? So yes, you can still do um, native plants in containers. It's a little, you have, you have to think about, again, going back to native plants and those, and accommodating those those deeper root systems. So, you know, if you um, don't have access to a yard or something like that, but you want to still um, kind of contribute to um, helping support those pollinators and things like that, um, there's, there's a couple of good options you could do. So there are um, about 17 to 20 gallon tubs that you can, you can use and um, put a few different native plants in there. And I'll, I'll go over some ones that can um, generally work in containers. If you do have more space, but still want it to be in a container, doing a 30 gallon like trash can um, is also another way to accommodate some of those ones with the deeper roots. Um, you can actually take like a five gallon, one of those pails you get at the supply store or something and flip that upside down to help fill in some of um, that in the 30 gallon container so you don't have to fill all of that with um, soil. But some of the ones that um, work better in containers that you can do are Black Eyed Susans, um, some of your purple cone flower, certain types of blazing stars, uh, as well as um, asters or coreopsis. Those are some, some of the ones that, um, depending on um, which specific one you go with, can work in those containers as well. So you can still do your part, like I said, supporting um, uh, you know, native pollinators and things like that, even in that um, more of a confined space. another specific plant question for you all. Um, aside from purple cone flowers, should I avoid any other colored cone flowers because they're non-native? I don't know who wants to take this one. I'll jump in. Okay. Um, some of the cone flowers don't come back well. So there's a white one called white swan. There's an orange one called meadow bright. When they have a name next to them that says 
like when uh, Nancy was talking about the Jacob Klein, if it says a name, those are cultivars. And they've been modified to bloom bigger or brighter or different color. And sometimes they lose something and we don't even don't know exactly. So um, the safest thing to do is stay with the that color, the plain uh, purple cone flower. Uh, there is a gray headed cone flower that's actually yellow, but that's got different tendencies. Doesn't look like the same cone flower you used to. So we try to encourage the true native, but um, some of the ones that are still close to it, they call it native R, where they're much closer to the native one, as opposed to the ones that have really been modified. Um, it's the way I would go about that. And if you wanted a different color other than purple, then I would change to a different species, which gives you a couple things. Not only do you, um, you change the bloom time and you change the attraction. So cone flowers will bring in certain things like finches, for example, or butterflies. And having something else as like a companion plant would be a good thing to do and, and add diversity to it. So um, I hope that answered your question. If not, I'm happy to answer more. <laughs> Anyone else have any follow-up to that? All right, well, going back to the list from before. Nancy, this is a good one for you. For I've got rocks around the foundation of my house. Should I leave them or should I take them out? I would assuming if you're doing kind of a uh, foundation around your house garden um, and you've got rocky soil. What's the best course, course of action there? Yeah, sometimes when people are buying a new house, it comes pre-landscaped, right? And that's something you may find. Maybe they're white or maybe there are red ones out there. The problem with the rocks is that when they get a lot of sun, they really heat up. And so that makes a very hot, dry situation for any plants you want to put in there. And I wouldn't really recommend anything other than the Eastern prickly pear cactus if you keep the rocks. We do have a cactus that is native to this area. Um, so yeah, I would recommend taking out the rocks. Um, and maybe they can be used somewhere else where, you know, it's a muddy patch and, you know, if it's like near a door or something like that, you don't really want to put in plants, but you need something you could step on, right? Maybe you could reuse them there. But for plants, I would not, um, not recommend putting in rocks. And can jump in there too. Back to just one one other comment. I totally agree with the Jim about the prairie plants are not accustomed to having wood. You know, you know, you really don't want to use a lot of wood mulch. If you do use the double shredded, finely shredded wood mulch, it's better around trees and shrubs. And if you can get leaves, save leaves or whatever, and use those instead to suppress the weed seeds. You know, that's preferable. I was going to mention about the, the rocks. Um, a lot of the prairie stuff is uh, fine with uh, gravelly soil. And many times people think like, what about these rocks in there? And there is rocks in soil. That's part of soil conditions. So many of these plants can take that soil without having to amend it. We don't really typically tell people to go buy peat moss and different things like that to add to the soil. So if you have gravelly soil, we'd get you plants that are happy in the gravel or clay or conditions. So I don't think you need to generally change all the soil in some area. Uh, so it depends on what it is. And other people ask me about large boulders. There's a large boulder over there. Should I get rid of it? And when you think about it, I mean, the boulder's not doing anything. It's not adding to the soil. It's not, it's just a just a rock sitting there and it can be very pretty when you plant around it so yeah. I typically would not tell people to wholesale changes in their yard the idea is this is supposed to be relatively easy and let the plants do the work sure well yeah that would make sense if you've got a lot of rocks mixed into your soil but as Nancy's example like if you come into a new house and they've used rocks as mulch and you've got that solid layer of, of surface rock, then then that's where it gets kind of hot, Nancy, and might 
That's right, right. So then, to Jim's point, you could dig it into the soil. <laughs> oh. Sounds like a heavy exercise to get it up and out. Too. <laughs> well, so another question about soil, and then maybe Connie, this will be a good one for you. Uh, a lot of us, you know, in terms of rocky soils, clay soils, you know, how do how do the veggies react to kind of our common Northeast Illinois soils? And is there anything that you would amend the soil with to, to be healthy and ready for your organic food? Yeah, uh, so for that question, that's actually very common, at least around our immediate area in particular, like certain parts of the suburbs, there are areas where we have uh, really only a couple or a few inches of topsoil and then we're hitting clay. We do have a lot of heavy clay. It holds water. Um, clay soil though also has a lot of nutrients. It's good nutrient content. So if you want to grow a wide range of things, you can try amending your soil by adding compost. You, you can't go wrong with adding a good compost. That does take time though. It's not easy to just amend the soil quickly or you know overnight it does take time so in the meantime just like with the native plants we want to plant things that will grow in the conditions we currently have so there are vegetables that can handle some clay like that so really a lot of the things in the in your brassica family which is again your your cabbage um kohlrabi, broccoli, cauliflower, kale, all, all of those things in that family, they can handle a bit of clay. And then a lot of your squash and melons can handle clay. Now, if it's standing water, a lot of plants aren't going to be happy with that. Your vegetables and herbs won't really love that. And a lot of our herbs actually prefer sandier soil, less nutrients, so some of your herbs won't thrive in a heavy clay. But if you just choose the vegetables that do like that area, and you can add compost as time goes on and, and work on improving that. Add all of those leaves, like Jim and Nancy have mentioned, um, and just keep improving the soil over time. It'll it'll benefit, but in the meantime, just plant what wants to grow in those conditions. You do have some choices. I just also I just, wanted to, to add in, too, um, to, to not, for folks not to forget about native edible um, plants in that mix, too, particularly when you're talking about if you don't want to um, get into amending soils. Um, some of our shrubs, again, are, are great for, um, again, working with what we have because they're already well adapted to the soils um, of this area. So, you know, plants like your um, service berries that have edible berries, as well as um, aronia berry um, is another one. Um, and both of those plants are actually pretty popular landscaping plants just because they're attractive um, without even, you know, people thinking about the edible qualities as well. Um, and then, you know, even elderberry is another one um, as, as well. So things like that and incorporating those in and around along with some of those um, annual veggies can help you work with the soil that you have and still get some um, edible stuff out of it. All right, so a follow-up to that, Kyla, um, from Julia. Recommendations on edibles for a front yard landscaping bed. It's about nine feet long and four feet wide area of space. So um, I guess, it is, I'm, I'm sorry, I might have missed it. She's talking about just like generally or specifically uh, native edibles or kind of a little bit of... A little bit of both. Uh, what... what this is edibles for a front yard landscaping bed. So, you know, I think, again, this kind of goes back to um, some of this when you're talking about in the front yard is like, you know, how like neat <laughs> do you want it to look versus not, um, you know, obviously things like your, your lettuces and a lot of even like your leafy plants and whatnot, um, depending on how you design that, that can look really nice. Um, I've actually even seen a number of cabbages just grown ornamentally <laughs> increasingly around in different areas. So um, cabbage is like another one that you can um, easily incorporate into that if you're trying to have a, a neater look. Um, you know, some of the, the low growing things like strawberries, um, those kind of tend to creep around um, on the ground. It can be more of like a, a ground cover. So um, you know, thinking about those things, and then even herbs. Um, if you're somebody who likes to um, cook with herbs a lot, a lot of those herbs 
um, look nice in, in a front yard landscape. So it really just kind of depends on what you like to eat, but also thinking about things that tend to probably be a little bit um, shorter um, and a little bit neater, but those, those would be some of my recommendations. I'm going to add just one thing to that quickly. Um, I, I definitely second what you're saying with the, all of the greens, because some of those can be beautiful, like some Swiss chard, some different types of kale, beet greens. So depending on what people like to eat, you know, some of those vegetables are beautiful and just mix right in with our landscaping plants. And the herbs that you mentioned, I always share the same story because it cracked me up when it happened. I had a neighbor who came over and wanted to know what the beautiful purple flowers were in my front yard. And they were just chives and they were the purple chive flowers and um, growing under my, my little cherry tree. And, um, but what I wanted to add, so all of that, I, I 100% agree with. Um, sometimes though, even some of the things that we traditionally think of as like messy or like vegetables that are not front yard vegetables can be made to look really pretty. So like cherry tomatoes, if they're growing on a beautiful arched trellis and they're trellised up with these little clusters of cherry tomatoes hanging down, they're beautiful. And you can do beans that flower or peas. So you have you have some options. You have to just get a little creative with the presentation, maybe. But lots of vegetables can be really pretty in the front yard. I love that. I planted some herbs in my front yard garden with the intention of using them, but then would always forget that they were there when we went grocery shopping and we'd buy the herbs. But my kiddos knew they were there, and they loved pulling off old tarragon leaves and pulling off, you know, uh, mint. They love the mint, of course. Um, if we actually put those in their food, they probably wouldn't eat them when they come inside, but it's just nice to get them out in the garden, interacting <laughs> about nature <laughs> a little bit. Um, okay, I'm trying to see if I've missed any questions here. Um, okay, here's another plant one, and then I think this might be the last one in here, unless people feel free to add your last questions in here as we come up on the hour. Um, regarding native plants, how careful should I be with, for instance, switchgrass, cup plant, savanna, blazing star, potentially spreading all over? What are kind of our, what are our problem children in terms of native plants? Um, anything in the silphium family, so that's cup plant, uh, prairie dock, compass plant, they want to spread. So if you have a little garden, this is not for the faint of heart. Um, in the grasses, switchgrass can be a little um, spreading so little blue stem or prairie drop seed are very well contained grasses that stay in their little clumps very nicely so I think uh, having this access and for anybody out there you can reach us through the Conservation Foundation you know 24 hours a day almost via email and, and put your questions out to us so it isn't that when this 2 o'clock comes up that Oh, gee, all the questions are, are over now. Um, we want to reach out to people and understand this is an ongoing process. Um, so those are the things that I would say. Um, and if you're unsure, like this question says, then contact us and we'll give you specific ideas for small areas that are not aggressive and then um, might be helpful. Well, in our remaining couple minutes, maybe each of you could go through and either, you know, uh, a commonly asked question you get that we didn't we didn't cover here, or just a resource like Jim was saying, you know, where to go for for more help. Um, and I'll start on the side of my screen. So, Kyla, any any uh, other burning questions that you think? Oh, one. <laughs> someone wants to know when spring will arrive. Also in the chat. <laughs> In due time. <laughs> right. Good question. <laughs> this has been a very interesting winter and um, spring so far. So, um, yes, we'll, we'll have to tune in and see. Um, I, I think I would just speak to briefly um, how, how both, you know, bringing together native plants along with your veggie plants, how well... Um, thinking about them and planting them is part of a broader system works. Um, those native plants can really pull in additional pollinators as well as some of those beneficial insects we were talking about. So they can help, you know, better pollinate your vegetable crops as well as with those beneficial insects. 
help really um, alleviate some of those garden pest pressures without having to um, use chemicals. Um, you know, the native plants are also um, helping, you know, build up your, your soil um, and, and the nutrients and things like that. And some of them are, are kind of pulling them up from deeper depths of, up to the surface, which can help, again, feed your, your veggie crops. So um, there's just really a lot of benefit in um, thinking about and planning those two things together. All right, Nancy, final thoughts. I think one thing we didn't touch on uh, too much is the benefit of native trees and shrubs. Kyla talked about um, edible, you know, shrubs and, and trees. Um, but in terms of the insects and the interaction between the insects and the native trees and shrubs, it's, it's really important to remember that um, for the birds, for instance, they need caterpillars. And the caterpillars only eat the leaves of native trees and shrubs and some of the perennials we've been talking about. So if you don't want to get into native plants because you think they're too messy, you can at least be thinking about what native trees and shrubs you can put in. And some of them are edible, like the circus berry. Um, so I think that's a really important thing to keep in mind. Yeah, a couple things there. So um, I think also part of our vegetable gardens too, like Kyla was saying, it is, it is really important to consider that as part of your whole space and part of the ecosystem. We have this tendency to think of our vegetable garden as separate from our native plants. And so I, I do wanna reiterate what Kyla was saying. And even within our vegetable and herb gardens, we can still, um, like for example, if you grow parsley or carrots, you'll probably have some swallowtails show up, you know, so they're, they really do go together. And um, with the trees and the shrubs, I think that's another thing too. I get a question, I get the question often about, um, you know, if I have shade in my yard, like I want to have trees and shrubs and I want to plant these things, but I don't want too much shade because I want to grow vegetables. So a lot of times people wonder if any of their vegetables can grow in kind of shadier areas. And so there's a general rule, and this is not, you know, 100% of the time, but just as a general rule, there's a fun little rhyme to help you remember that if you're growing a plant for the root or the fruit, so like a beet or a tomato, those plants tend to need more sun. But a lot of our leafy greens, the lettuce, the kale, those things, and a lot of our herbs can handle a little bit of light shade. So um, if you have areas maybe on the edge of your garden, maybe put the, save the sunniest spots for your tomatoes, and in those areas that are kind of light shade or dappled shade you can still grow plenty of vegetables in those areas as well so definitely bring in the trees and the shrubs <laughs> like nancy was saying and um, let's incorporate all of that and create that little ecosystem that's edible for us and for the wildlife supporting that as well awesome. and last but not least jim i would say there was a theme that ran through this session today about uh, poor soil so i would add in highly urge people to compost we have composters if you want to use your kitchen scraps and these composters have a locking top so that the critters don't get in there but even if you didn't go out and buy a composter to save your leaves and turn them in the soil stack them up and that organic material is so critical for the soil and we're bagging our leaves or grass clippings all that organic stuff that is um, being produced on our property we want to get it back into the dirt and improve the soil so uh, read more about composting look on our site for information and certainly save the organics that you have definitely and throughout this session folks i have included links to our compost rain barrel sale page if you're interested in purchasing one of those um, to the to the plant kit designs, as I mentioned, those go on sale this week, um, and to our plant sale page that'll have all the details about when our plants go on sale. We'll have um, the same probably four faces you see here today will be on hand during our plant sale as well to answer questions that people might have while they're shopping, um, and and encourage you to keep asking questions. The info account I put our our general info 
at theconservationfoundation.org in the chat as well. Please reach out to us. That is absolutely what we're here for. We're so glad that you're interested in native gardening and growing organic veggies at your home. Um, any sort of help you need or resource that we can be, we are here for it. And thanks for spending a little bit of your Monday afternoon with us. We really appreciate you uh, adding your questions to the chat and hope to see you again soon. So thank you so much, everybody.